the Ground Zero 9-11 uh, memorial uh, plan design of which you were, uh, were a part. As you go down there today, I don't know how often you, you spend time I live there. there and I work there. Um, <laughs> so now that you see it living and breathing from conception to reality, how would you reflect on what it became and did it fill your dreams? Is it different from what? what, what no, you... I'm so lucky. When I look at my first drawings and I look, you know, as I walk through a site, it's exactly what I drew. You know, let's not forget, a master plan is like, I used to be a musician, professional musician. A master plan is like writing a score. You gotta write a score, you know, it's gotta be perfect geometrically, perfect acoustically. It can't have approximations, it's gotta be exact. But you have to give it over to others and you have to also give them a range of interpretability, otherwise you've got mechanical music. You gotta give them a range of freedom in, in playing those notes. And you, as a conductor of such a master plan, are not facing the public. Your back is to the public. You're not the first violin. You're not the tuba. You're not the you know, flute. You're not the cello. But it just shows that if you bring consensus, and that was my idea, I believe, I'm a believer in democracy. I don't think that, that democracy is second to anything. We take it for granted. If you believe that you can talk to people who disagree, and I did, you know, the investors were of a different mind, the families of the victim, the governors were of a different mind, the mayor was a different, the, the MTA, the path. If you can bring them together around the table and say, you know, we have a shared interest here. Let's, let's, that's how that site is now an engine for development of all of Lower Manhattan. It's right. 200,000 people moved down, down, downtown. And when you go there and you sit and you have your meditative platonic session there. It, no, it's just a Starbucks. Just coffee. a Starbucks, okay. Uh, <laughs> what is the thing that pops out to you? It's like, yes, that worked. That thing worked. Well, the, what comes to my mind, I took a very radical decision. I, I turned half of the site into public space. 16 acres, not a lot of space. I said eight acres, public space. Put the building as far away from the public space as possible on the periphery of the site. Make them so that they are buildable, so they are not monsters and mega structures and require a lot of money. They are conventional buildings built in a kind of symbolic way. Create not only the sense of memory with the footprints and with the, uh, and with the waterfalls, but go all the way down to bedrock, the slurry wall. Get a sense that you're sharing an experience that is both historical, but also opens new perspectives for New York, new mm. beauty. And by the way, this is how I thought. My mother and my father, you know, they were immigrants, and they worked in the sweatshop. My mother in the garment industry, my father is a printer on Stone Street. So I said to myself, my parents would never be in those beautiful buildings, right? Because they, they wouldn't be there, they're working people. Uh, where would they be? They'd be in the subways, they'd be in the path trains, they'd be on the streets of New York running, you know, sh you know trying to, Feed Schlepping, their family. Schlepping. The yeah. To, yeah. What do I give them? That's what I thought. What do I give regular New Yorkers who are not going to be in those buildings? You give them space. Public space which is shaped in dramatic ways.